He called his system of thought pragmatism, a word that I did not include in the title of the talk because it's often mistaken for the adjective pragmatic and taken to mean without principles, shallow and opportunistic, but nothing uh, could be more wrong. Peirce's pragmatism is a theory of knowledge that rebuilds philosophy from the ground up. It confronts assumptions that have been fundamental to Western thought, at least since the time of Rene Descartes, and turns them inside out. My limited aim tonight is to present just enough of Peirce's thought so that you might be inspired to pick up his writings and to read more. So I'm going to focus on only two points. First, Peirce's abandonment of the search for absolute certainty. Although Peirce begins as a disciple of Immanuel Kant, he does not think that a priori synthetic knowledge of the world is possible. Instead, he offers a more modest goal of increasing our confidence in the uncertain but probable knowledge that is within our grasp. Second, Peirce's new vision of reality that discards the dualism, which had dominated much of Western philosophy since Descartes and before him since Plato, really, Peirce does not conceive us as prisoners in a cave or isolated bits of thinking race cogitans separated from one another by uncomprehending expanses of material race extensa. We and the world that we seek to know are at bottom things of the same kind. We are, the world is signs and we who seek to know it are signs as well. Hmm. Okay. The lecture contains seven parts, and the outline on this PowerPoint screen, uh, which will show up from time to time, will help orient you as to what part you're in and how long it's going to take before the whole thing is over. <laughs> before explaining my two points about Peirce's thought, I think it'll be helpful to present a thumbnail sketch of the philosophic background against which Peirce's ideas came about. Peirce was widely read but two principal figures that provide a context for his thought are Rene Descartes and Immanuel Kant. Descartes is sometimes credited with single-handedly turning the course of European thought away from metaphysics and theology and towards epistemology, that is, the study of how knowledge is possible. In Descartes' life, the foundations of knowledge were being challenged from many directions. Religious, economic, and social unrest were widespread in Europe, modern science, was coming into light with uh, Galileo promoting the new Copernican heliocentric understanding of the world. In the midst of this turmoil, Descartes proposed new foundations on which knowledge might stand. He brazenly rejected all reliance on tradition and ordinary academic research and declared his project to be a reestablishment of all truths solely on the basis of what he himself found with clarity and distinctness within his own intellect. It was a move of astonishing audacity for those who admire him and of arrogance for those who don't. Two features of Descartes' thought were especially significant for Peirce. The first is Descartes' pretense of complete doubt and his obsessive search for absolutely certain knowledge that could stand up against it. In the beginning of his meditations, Descartes shut himself up in a room by himself and set out to doubt everything that he could. He dismissed religious and philosophic authorities and called into question even the testimony of his own senses until he arrived at a single proposition that he believed was beyond all possible doubt. His famous, je pense donc je suis, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. In an era of religious, economic, and scientific upheaval, Descartes wanted certainty. Any propositions that withstood the attacks of his radical doubt would qualify, he felt sure, as absolute certainties. A second characteristic of Cartesian thought that I want to emphasize is his dualism. Descartes was not the first dualist thinker, but he was one of the most relentless and thorough. He believed and stated clearly that the world was divided into two separate kinds of substances, race cogitans, the realm of thought, and race extensa, the extended material world. The inner world of thought contains reflection, reason, and all subjectivity. The outer world embraces all sorts of things, trees and mountains, fields and streams, shoes and ships and sealing wax and cabbages and kings. But because these two realms are so different, it became a puzzle for Descartes how they can influence one another and how one can know the other. 
This question has continued to perplex philosophers for decades and centuries. Any thinker who begins with an idea of radical difference between thought and matter must wrestle with some form of Descartes' question, how can we who are thinking beings gain any certain knowledge of the outer extended world? When Immanuel Kant confronted this problem a little more than a century after Descartes' death, his inquiry was intensified by two divergent features, one of which made knowledge of the world seem more accessible and the other of which made it seem impossible. On the positive side, Descartes lived in the shadow of the physical science of Isaac Newton, whose scientific picture of the world was so comprehensive and so rigorously tested that it seemed inconceivable that it was anything other than the simple truth of how the world worked. For Kant, to ask about whether real knowledge of the world is possible is like the Baptist preacher who asks his neighbor whether he believes in infant baptism. And the neighbor replies, believe in it? Hell, I've seen it done. The proper question in Kant's mind was never whether we can have genuine knowledge of the world. Hell, he'd seen it done. Newton did it. The only question for him was how we could do it. The negative prod to, Newton, to uh, Kant's questioning came when he read David Hume's Treatise of Human Nature. To Kant's great annoyance, Hume pointed out, that although we can perceive objects and their relations in the world, we cannot perceive their causes. To cite Hume's famous example, we may see one billiard ball approach another one. We may see the first stop and the second ball move away. However, these impressions of sequence and coincidence do not show us the cause why one ball moved and the other one, didn't, uh, the other one stopped, because they don't show the necessary connection between the events that is essential to the idea of cause. Worse, the problem is not limited to billiard balls. For instance, a little reflection shows that none of the key elements of Newton's great physical science, mass, force, inertia, gravity, absolute space, absolute time, none of them appear as distinct impressions to us. If we take Hume's critique seriously, Newton's Principia begins to seem like a crazy quilt of guesswork. Kant would have none of that. An edifice as exalted as Newton's physics needed an unshakable basis. Therefore, determined to refute Hume's skepticism, Kant set to thinking. He thought and he thought and he thought till his thinker was sore and when he was done, he had the critique of pure reason. <laughs> the critique begins as Hume begins with experience, but it adds a crucial qualification. Although our knowledge begins with experience, it does not follow, says Kant, that it arises from experience. Some of it comes from us. Appearances, say Kant, show themselves to us only on terms that depend on us as perceivers. For instance, in order to be appearances, Kant claims, the presentation of the senses necessarily appear in space and in time. They do so not because things in themselves are this way, but because our faculty of sensible intuition imposes these forms on their appearances. This is a counterintuitive claim to say the least, but it has one great advantage. Since we do not learn about space and time from the world, but we impose these forms on the world, we can know with absolute certainty that they will apply to all possible sensible experience. Consider a metaphor that I find helpful, my television set. When I turn it on, I don't know what I will see. It may be as big as a whale or a mountain. It may be as small as a microbe. But I can say with complete certainty and ahead of time, which in Latin is a priori, that the image that appears will be no longer than 24 inches across and that it will consist of a limited selection of colors arranged in a two-dimensional pattern. I know that. With a priori certainty, not because of the nature of things that I'm going to see on television, but because that's how my television is constructed. In this way, Kant argues that we can know some basic characteristics of the world as it appears with perfect certainty. Besides knowing that all appearances, all appearances will be spatial and temporal, Kant believed that the categories of understanding 
which all of our experience is shaped by, require that every event in the world, uh, the world of appearances at least, have a cause. This is the crux of his answer to Hume. Furthermore, because he held that the three-dimensional Euclidean manifold in which appearances occur is a part of the necessary precondition of experience, he believed that we can even know a priori that attractive forces like gravity, which extend outward spherically, will necessarily have intensities that diminish inversely as the square of the distance. That rule of diminution follows from the expansion of the sphere, and the sphere is a structure of our sensible intuitions. Thus, Kant grounds the integrity of Newton's universe. Kant considered his philosophical work to be a sort of Copernican revolution. Just as Copernicus had turned the astronomical world inside out, so that many of the apparent motions of the stars turned out to be the result of our motion and not theirs, so Kant found certainty in those portions of experience that are determined not by the objects that we perceive, but by the form of our own ability to sense and to think. Thus, Kant addressed Descartes' question, how can we gain any certain knowledge of the objective world? By arguing that some certainties are found within ourselves. However, as revolutionary as, it, as his answer might have been, it retains some of the basic features of Descartes' own positions. First, Kant agreed with Descartes that the goal to be sought was certain knowledge that would stand the challenge of skepticism. Second, like Descartes, Kant retained a sort of dualism. Instead of the Cartesian division between race extensa and race cogitans, Kant separates the empirical world of appearances from the realm of noumena, the objects of thought that are not found in the sensory experience. The chasm between these two is so wide, in fact, that it's doubtful that it can really be bridged. In the former, the laws of that is the world of appearances, the laws of mechanical physics apply. In the latter reside God, freedom, immortality, ideal features of human existence that have nothing to do with Newton's laws. We somehow partake in both. I apologize for the length of that introduction, but as Arlo Guthrie said in his song, Alice's Restaurant, I told you that story so I could tell you this one. The young Peirce steeped himself in the philosophy of Kant, but he did not embrace Kant's and Descartes' goal of obtaining perfect necessity and universal knowledge about the, perfect necessary and universal knowledge about the world or of any part of it. By the mid 19th century, when Peirce began thinking seriously, the plausibility of Kant's project had faded, due in part to the innovations in geometry and logic. In 1830, non-Euclidean geometry burst upon the intellectual scene in the works of Nikolai Lobachevsky, Janos Boliai, and Carl Friedrich Gauss. Each independently showed that geometries that repealed and replaced the Fifth Amendment, uh, pardon me, the Fifth Postulate, <laughs> of Euclid with other assumptions about parallel lines were not only conceivable, but demonstrably consistent. These results, technical as they were, shook the foundations of thought because they dramatically detached logical consistency from sensory appearance. For thousands of years, logic and geometry were essentially synonymous with Aristotle and Euclid. The geometric structure that Euclid presented in the elements had for centuries been identified with the shape of physical space itself, so much so that their identity seemed a logical necessity. But it was not. And Kant's cheerful assumption that Euclid had shown him the one true and necessary science of space could not survive. By the time the young Peirce was poring over The Critique of Pure Reason, a book that he claims to have read so often that he had memorized its contents, it was evident that Kant had mistaken at least some long-standing familiar beliefs with a priori truths. This was not a minor error. It attacked the foundations of his entire project. The young Peirce could no longer assume, as Kant had, that we possess a priori truths about the world. And I quote now, quote, uh, according to Kant, says Peirce, the central question of philosophy is how are synthetic judgments a priori possible? But antecedently comes the question, how synthetical judgments in general, and still more generally, how synthetical reasoning is possible at all? This is the lock on the door of philosophy. Close quote. 
In opening that lock, Peirce expanded and revised the understanding of logic, and at the same time, he rejected some of Descartes' fundamental starting points. In the next two sections, we turn to two of those changes, Peirce's abandonment of the Cartesian quest for certainty and his rejection of Descartes' dualistic ontology. In an early paper, 1868, Peirce identifies a number of what he calls questions concerning certain faculties claimed for man. The first among these is this, as a long quote, I'm sorry for this. Whether by the simple contemplation of a cognition independently of any previous knowledge and without reasoning from signs, we are rightly enabled to judge whether that cognition has been determined by a previous cognition or whether it refers immediately to its object, close quote. That is, can we know by direct inspection of our own sensations whether any of them connect immediately to the world outside us? Peirce's proposed answer to his question is no. To show what he means, I'd like to try a little demonstration. And for that, we're going to need the house lights up. Uh, I asked you all to be sure to get a handout and a penny. What I'd like you to do is to take the handout and turn to the side that doesn't have a bunch of text on it, that's got a bunch of lines. There's a dark spot on one side and a, and a light circle on the other. The dark spot should be on the left. Have it kind of in your lap in front of you. If you've got a book, some people do. It might be nice to support it with a book. Take the penny and put it on the little circle to the left. Uh, to the right, rather, yes. <laughs> then, now these are, these are Purse's instructions. Put your left hand over your left eye. With your right eye, looking at the dot, so you'll be looking across your nose at the dot. Uh, take the penny and move it along the line toward the dot. When it comes to a place near the middle of the page, the penny will disappear. You cannot see it without turning your eye. If you bring it nearer to the dot or carry it further away, it will reappear, but at that particular spot, it's invisible. Now give it a try. We'll take a minute. Is it clear to what to do? Put the penny, slide it along toward the dot while you've got, you're looking only through one eye. And as it goes along, it should come to a place where it disappears. If and when you get to the point that it disappears, keep your eye focused on that dot. The penny is, you feel the penny with your finger or you can let it go, but, and you won't see it. Without moving your eye, you're seeing out in your peripheral vision. Pay attention to this. The lines are still there in your peripheral vision. Don't move it too fast because you're going to want to find that place. And you may have to kind of lean over a little bit so you're looking down at it. Let me ask this question. Has anybody succeeded? Yes. Yes. All right. There are people who have succeeded. <laughs> Talk to them later. Okay. There is a simple reason why the penny disappears. There's a blind spot near the center of your retina. Anatomy confirms that this is so. It's the place where the optic nerves enters the eye. When the light conveying the image of the penny is focused on that spot, it stimulates no nerves. There's no signal to the brain and the penny disappears. The really interesting feature of this demonstration, which is straight out of Peirce's uh, essay, uh, Four Consequences, um, consequences of the four incapacities. Um, the interesting feature of this demonstration is not that the penny disappears, but that the image of the lined paper is there. If you perform the experiment on plain white paper, the penny will disappear and there will be whiteness where it was. If you try it on graph paper, there'll be blocks. If you try it on text, there'll be text, although you can't read it. It'll be in your peripheral vision and you won't be able to read it. Uh, that's good. <clears throat> because you're not actually seeing anything. <laughs> the demonstration shows very plainly that at least at this spot, we do not see what is really in front of our eyes. Instead, some process of inference determines what is likely to be there 
and shows it to us. Again, to quote Peirce, it follows that the space we immediately see when one eye is closed is not, as we had imagined, a continuous oval, but is a ring, the filling up of which must be the work of the intellect. What more striking example could be desired of the impossibility of distinguishing intellectual results from intuitional data by near contemplation? The blind spot, dem close quote. the blind spot demonstration is more than an amusing parlor trick. It forces on us the conclusion that we do not simply see what our eyes present to us. In the area of the blind spot, what we believe we see is not direct visual presentation, but some sort of unconscious inference from the surrounding region. What's more, we have every reason to believe that what happens strikingly in the region of the blind spot occurs also in a more subtle way throughout our field of vision. Peirce knows from anatomical studies that the receptors in the rest of the retina are too widely spread to account for the apparent continuity of our visual field. The blind spot experiment demonstrates why our visual field does not appear like a grainy video. What we catch ourselves doing in the blind spot is happening really everywhere in our visual field all the time. Our minds are filling in the gaps in those places just like they do in the blind spot. What we see everywhere and at all times is the end result of an extensive process of inference. Many other optical illusions present the same conclusion, some more even, even more strikingly. Here's one, if I can get it to work. Yes. Notice the squares labeled A and B. A is a dark square, B is a light square. That's obvious. Our eyes tell us that it's so, but our eyes are lying to us. With a little manipulation, you can assure yourself that the grayscale tone of the two squares is really identical. Here again, what you see is not a direct image of the tones and colors presented to your eyes, but a worked up interpreted presentation of the situation that takes account of the expectation imposed by the image that square B must be a light square in the shadow and that square A is a dark square in full light. Your eyes do not connect you directly to the world. Together with, their, with your mind, they interpret the world for you. It's the same with the other senses. What we feel or hear is also the result of inference. Soft or hard texture cannot be distinguished with a moment's touch. To tell that something is soft or rough, you must run your hand over it, and you integrate the manifold of the sensation over time. What's reported to your mind is the result of that integration. Similarly, sound results from thousands and hundreds of thousands of rapid pressure oscillations striking our ears. We are never aware of any of those individual impulses, but only of the tone that results from them. The tone that we hear or the softness that we feel is evidently a sensible inference from a manifold of individually imperceptible occurrences. What do we learn from the disappearing penny and the other examples? A Kantian might at first rejoice and feel vindicated. After all, these demonstrations seem to show the mind is active in shaping the chaos of raw intuition into coherent experience. That's just what Kant wanted us to believe, right? Not exactly. It's true that Kant was interested in how the mind formed experience, but he was primarily interested in the pre-existing shape, uh, ex shape of the mind itself, the forms of sensible intuition and the categories of the understanding, which he believed he knew from some direct inner intuition or self-awareness, and which would be in ineluctably stamped upon all of our sensory experience of the world. But we don't have any such direct intuition, inner intuition. Moreover, when we do catch the mind as in these cases, shaping our sensory experience, it's not dictating an ineluctable form. It's making guesses based on evidence available. With the penny and the blind spot, the mind filled in regions with guesses about what was probably there. With the checkerboard shadow image, the mind corrects the tones of the squares in recognition of the circumstances present in the picture. In both cases, the visual system presented to the mind was an inference, and in both cases, it was demonstrably wrong. Other suppositions about the world, including some that Kant took to be a priori necessary truths, fare no better, as later experience shows. 
Um, Newton, for example, thought that objects in the world exist in a three-dimensional manifold of space and a one-dimensional manifold of time, and Kant accepted space and time as a priori forms of the sensible intuition. But after Einstein's theory of general relativity made its appearance just one year after Peirce's death, it became increasingly clear that Euclidean space and linear time as separate forms were never more than useful guesses about the shape of the world. Ponder these examples. Consider carefully that everything you see, hear, feel is an inference based on other inferences receding into dimness that we cannot penetrate. Nothing presents itself with immediate directness, and if it did, you wouldn't be able to know it. Inference follows inference, clue connects to clue without apparent beginning or end. As you consider this picture, you begin to enter into Peirce's understanding of the world. What appears to us as simple perceptions, the piece of paper, the light and dark squares in the chessboard, this lectern, that glass of water, you people, are not presented to us directly, even as appearances. They are inferences. They're built upon premises, and they require interpretation. In Peirce's way of speaking, they result from signs. We are surrounded by signs, and our lives are constant processes of sign interpretation. Because we're familiar with the world in which we live and have long practiced at maneuvering through it, most of our interpretations are correct, or at any rate, pass off unchallenged. They get us to where we're going. If we ever become aware of them failing, it's because we've encountered conflicting signs that contradict them that call for more elaborate interpretation. We know that the retina has a blind spot into which the penny has disappeared because we can consult other signs. We move our eyes, we feel the penny with our finger. That's other information that revises our retina's original guess with what is really a better guess. But there's never certainty. There's only a web of inference on which our guesses rely, a web that we have reason to believe, or at least to hope, grows continually and increasingly reliable. Speaking of reliable, ah, now it's gonna go. Digression on logic. It's worth pausing for a moment over the term inference. Peirce uses it in a rather broad sense, uh, rather broader sense, rather, uh, broader sense than might be familiar from traditional logic. We may be accustomed to think of inference only along the lines of Aristotelian deductive syllogisms. A simple deduction might look like this. Socrates is a human, all humans are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. This syllogism can be understood in terms of class inclusion. We picture a predication A is B as a drawing in which a shape representing A is included in a larger shape representing B. Again, the shape representing the Bs is included in a shape representing Cs and so forth, and we can go on and on with our deductions. And I just went too far, didn't I? Back. What? Uh, well then, we move on. If you're seeking perfectly certain conclusions from perfectly known premises, deductive syllogism is certainly the way to go, since once the premises are accepted, the conclusions follow necessarily. However, very little inferential reasoning proceeds according to deductive syllogism. In the real world, it is rare to have perfectly known premises. Indeed, much of the work of the mind consists of searching for premises. Okay, come on. Could you take me back to slide 18, or uh, 16 rather? There you go, that's good. From which deductions might be attempted. For that search, something other than deductive syllogism is required. Peirce embraces an expansive view of logic. As far as he is concerned, any mental act that gets you from premise A to conclusion B, whether with certainty or only with some enhanced probability, is a kind of inference. Deductions count, of course, but so do other less conclusive forms of thought. For example, suppose that we said, now, next, Socrates is human, Socrates is mortal, therefore, all humans are mortal. There we go. Socrates is human, Socrates is mortal, Therefore, all humans are mortal. What is that? It's a fallacy? Well, it's certainly not a deduction. It, 
But it is a form of thinking, and a slightly different form, and a fairly common one. In this example, the conclusion is very weak because it is founded on only one instance. But suppose we said, Socrates is human, Socrates is mortal, therefore all humans are mortal. Plato is a human, Plato is mortal. Aristotle is human, Aristotle is mortal. C.S. Peirce is human, C.S. Peirce is mortal. I've met or read about thousands of humans and all of them are mortal. <laughs> this is still not infallible reasoning. The very next person I meet might be Merlin, or the Highlander, or the prophet Elijah, someone who's not mortal. But it's valuable. It is induction, and everybody uses it. Consider the following. I ate at Taco King on Monday, and I got sick. I ate at Taco King on Tuesday, and I got sick. I ate at Taco King on Wednesday, and I got sick. I'm never going to eat at Taco King again. That's induction. Induction is an imperfect but extremely useful form of reasoning by which one can attain universal statements which can be used themselves or fed into deductive syllogisms. Universal statements are not only useful in reasoning, they're also important to memory. Universals can often be remembered when the instances on which they're based are forgotten. The general statement, Taco King is sick making, is shorter, simpler, and more easily remembered than the dates of all the times I got sick. Much of the usefulness of induction consists precisely in that simplification which Peirce identifies with Kant's goal of reducing the manifold to unity. There's another order in which the terms of our deduction can be rearranged. Socrates is human, all humans are mortal, therefore Socrates is immortal. Let's rearrange it. All humans are mortal, Socrates is mortal, therefore Socrates is human. Okay. What's that? It's not a deduction. It's kind of a fallacy. It's actually hypothesis, or what uh, Peirce calls abduction. With only one instance like this, it's a fairly weak form of reasoning. But what if I said, all humans stand upright, Socrates stands upright. All humans have two legs, Socrates has two legs. All humans are warm-blooded, Socrates is warm-blooded. All humans use speech, Socrates uses speech. Now it's looking better and better. Now, it could be that it's not, well, it's certainly not perfect. Socrates could be a bipedal talking dog. <laughs> but as we get more and more instances, the hypothesis or abduction becomes more and more reliable. Peirce calls, uh, calls this process abduction. We use it all the time. Suppose you hear a radio report that says that a six foot four inch bearded man wearing dark glasses, green pants, and a red and yellow striped shirt had just robbed a nearby bank and is armed, dangerous, and loose in your neighborhood. Suppose then you saw a six foot four inch bearded man wearing dark glasses, green pants, and a red and yellow striped shirt carrying a gun and a bag with a dollar sign on it, walking hurriedly down your street. What would you do? What would you say to the student of logic who haughtily pointed out that the inference on which you base your decision to go inside, lock the door, and call the police was fallacious? By the way, one academic article points out that it's an interesting coincidence, I think it is an interesting coincidence, if nothing more, that Peirce was formalizing these kinds of reasoning, including hypothesis and induction, abduction, hypothesis, induction, abduction, based on probabilistic thinking, at the same time that a new genre of literature, the detective novel, was becoming popular. The first appearance of Sherlock Holmes occurred in a study in Scarlet in 1886, just about the time that Peirce left the only academic post he ever held at Johns Hopkins University. Holmes refers to his method as deduction, but Peirce, I think, would classify many of his conclusion as hypotheses or abductions. Reasoning doesn't have to be perfect to be useful, and it doesn't cease to be a form of inference just because it might be mistaken. Abandon the goal of absolute certainty and other forms of inference gain places of respect in your logical system. The inference of your visual system, um, that, your, that your visual system makes with the penny and the blind spot, is a form of hypothesis. It says, in effect, the area above the blind spot is white, the area below the blind spot is white. It would make sense if the whole region were white. In the demonstration we made, uh, we carefully contrived the situation in order to trick your eyes, and we got a mistaken inference, but it was not simply a piece of foolishness. 
These non-deductive forms of reasoning are crucial to Peirce's renovation of Kant's project. Kant's original goals were unattainable. We have no direct intuitive knowledge of the form of our minds, which we might leverage to find out a sort of a priori necessary and universal certainty that Kant hoped to obtain. However, though we can't have certainty, Peirce seeks to find ways that we, to establish comparative confidence in our knowledge by comprehensive and careful investigation into the grounds of the validity of logic and of probability and of induction. Well-founded confidence with a margin of anticipatable error may not have the philosophical glamour of perfect apodectic certainty, but it's what's available to us, and it's better than the alternative of falling back into Hume's skeptical despair. Speaking of Hume, one may ask, if Peirce abandons Kant's dream of obtaining a priori necessary and universal truths, doesn't he just wind up with David Hume's skeptical wasteland, in David Hume's skeptical wasteland, the very place that Kant was trying to escape? The short answer is no. And the reason depends in large part on Peirce's different vision of reality. Hume and other empiricists, empiricists maintain a dualistic separation between the mind and the world that it tries to know. If that gap cannot be bridged, then there is reason to be deeply concerned. However, what Hume considered to be impressions of the external world, Peirce understood differently as signs. The difference between the two lies in how they connect us to the world. An impression is, in, uh, is informative because it arises from the mute extended material world that provoked it. A sign, by contrast, points ahead to the coherent world of thought that it supports. To articulate this difference more fully, it might be helpful to describe Peirce's concept of reality and the distinction between nominalism and realism that Peirce adopts from medieval logicians, a fun-loving crowd that we really need to get to know better. <laughs> the realist John Duns Scotus and the nominalist William of Ockham. The issue at stake between nominalists and realists turns on the reality or unreality of universals, that is, general terms that cover a multitude of instances, such as animal, mammal, humankind, it goes on and on. A nominalist holds that such universal terms are fictions that we invent for our own convenience. The realist, by contrast, holds that they are real. Inevitably, the discussion between these two schools soon turns to the hackneyed question, what is real? An old chestnut that students and sometimes tutors occasionally toss out as conversation stoppers. <laughs> but Peirce is not afraid of this question. He has an answer for it. By real, Peirce means, quote, that which is unaffected by what we may think of it, close quote. The real is what we cannot wish away or think away. My daydreams are unreal because I can banish them with a thought. The stone in my shoe stays there, whatever I think, until I reach down and take it out. The stone is real, my daydreams are not. But what are the real things? And are logical universals among them? Here, opinions differ. Some people suppose, reasonably, that the real comes to us in sensation. Sensations are what connect us to the world out there. They don't change with our thoughts. Pardon me. So, for example... Look at this. It's a drinking cup. I see it. You see it. We all see it. Its reality does not permit us to imagine it away. The nominalist would tell us it is real because we sense it. And the fact that it is a cup is just a label that we put on a pattern of sensations. The alternative to that sensation-based nominalist approach is realism. Realism is the idea that general, I that general ideas... Embrace and that embrace and coordinate a multitude of sensations have a reality that individual sensations do not. Let me repeat that. Realism says that general ideas that embrace and coordinate a multitude of sensations have a reality that individual sensations do not. Peirce offers the following story to illustrate the distinction between sensation and the reality of generals. Suppose, he says, Two men, one deaf and the other blind. One hears a man declare he means to kill another. Hears the report of the pistol and hears the victim cry. 
The other sees the murder done. <clears throat> their sensations are affected in the highest degree with their individual peculiarities. The first information that their sensations will give them, their first inferences will be more nearly alike. Um, the first information their sensations will give them, their first inferences will be more nearly alike, but still different. The one having, for example, the idea of a man shouting, the other of a man with a threatening aspect. But their final conclusions, the thought the remotest from sense, will be identical and free from the one-sidedness of their idiosyncrasies. The parable warns the reader not to confuse the real with the sensory. The blind man heard only sounds. The deaf man saw only sights. Their sensations did not overlap in any way. If the real meant what has an existence independent of your mind or mine, then these two people's sensations are the opposite of real, since the difference between what the one person experienced and the other depended entirely on their peculiar competences. However, when the blind man reflects on what he's heard and the deaf man on what he saw, the two converge on a reality that does not depend on either of them. They don't agree on the flash of light, that the deaf man saw but the blind man did not. They don't agree on the shout and the bang which the blind man heard but the deaf man did not. They do agree that there was a murder. That was the fact that does not depend on the peculiarities of perceptions available to either observer. That a general term removed from immediate sensation is more stable, more permanent and independent of the peculiarities of this or that individual is crucial for Peirce. The closer you get to the raw sensation of experience, if there even is such a thing which I think Peirce doubts, the more confused and erratic it seems. To locate what is universal requires the sort of work that our minds do all the time as they correct for odd perspectives and fill in blanks omitted by our nerve impulses. We identify things according to their sort and kind as best we can. Our freshmen know this from their classification practicum in the mountains up behind the campus. This is a juniper tree, they say. That's a ponderosa pine. By so identifying them, they slot them into categories that are communicable and independent of this or that observer. They employ universals that are, in this way of thinking, real. Peirce is a realist. His realism is not a sort of mystical Platonism that imagines that the ideals wander about in heaven. It's a more commonplace recognition that the world we live in does not consist of a blooming, buzzing confusion of disorganized sensation, but in identifiable things, juniper trees and clouds and tables and animals. All these labels are universals. They are in the world that we experience. They are the world that we experience. The manifold of sensations that we encounter is unreal for us until we find universals in it. Then we say, ah, it's a juniper tree, or ah, it's an aspen, where all my jumble of sensations is mine alone. An identified object, a juniper or an aspen, is real. That is what is independent of who is looking at it. Peirce considered that his realism was consistent with his continued allegiance, at least in part, with Kant's viewpoint. He understood Kant's Copernican revolution in philosophy as a turn toward realism in his sense of the term, since it meant that one was, quote, to regard the reality, to, to regard reality as the normal product of mental action and not as the incognizable cause of it. With this framework in mind, we can sort out how Peirce differs from Hume. When Hume talks about sensations, he understands them to be impressions that we can think about. When Peirce considers the same process, he considers that what we encounter is always already a part of an inferential process. There is no foundation of raw, unprocessed perception upon which we base our thoughts. Rather, what we see, hear, or feel, what we think, is the result of inferential guesses that have already occurred and will be the basis for more inferential guesses what we see, hear, or feel is not appearance, since that might suggest that it is the immediate product of what the world pushes upon us. Rather, Peirce calls it a sign because it gets its significance from what it points to. For Peirce, any cognition is a sign pointing to other cognitions. In his own words, quote, this theory of reality would encourage us to regard the appearances of sense only as signs of reality. Only the realities that which they represent would not be the unknowable cause of sensation, but noumena 
or intelligible conceptions, which are the last products of mental action, which is set in motion by sensation. Close quote. Our encounters with the world are signs that point toward the universals that constitute the reality of things. All thought takes place through the interaction of signs building on signs. In this web of signification, we too are signs pointing toward an ideal of coherence that each of us may only imperfectly achieve. When we think, says Peirce, quote, then we ourselves, as we are at that moment, appear as signs. The thought sign which is ourself may, through the medium of outward expression, which it reaches perhaps only after considerable internal development, come to address itself to the thought of another person. But whether this happens or not, it is always interpreted by a subsequent thought of our own. Close quote. Unlike Descartes, Hume, or even Kant, Peirce envisions a non-dual world. There are not thinking things over here and inanimate extended, objects, inanimate extended objects over there. Instead, everywhere there are signs, things signified, and interpretations that are bound together in a triadic relationship that makes inference, that is thought, of the world possible. It's from this monistic and semiotic that is filled with signs, vision of the world, that Peirce can make the strange and evocative pronouncement from which the title of this lecture is taken. Quote, what distinguishes a person from a word, says Peirce? There is a distinction, doubtless. The material qualities and the meaning of the human sign are all extremely, exceedingly complicated in comparison with those of the word. But these differences are only relative. The human sign acquires information and comes to mean more than he or she did before. But so do words. Does not electricity mean more now than it did in the days of Franklin? A human makes the word, and the word means nothing, which the human has not made it mean, and that only to some other person. But since a person can think only by means of words or other external symbols, these might turn around and say to him, you mean nothing which we have not taught you, and then only as far as you address some other word as the interpretant of your thought. In fact, therefore, humans and words reciprocally educate each other, each increase of a person's information involves and is involved by a corresponding increase of a word's information. In the shadow of scientific and mathematical discoveries of the 19th century, Kant's answer to Hume's skeptical despair was no longer viable. Charles Sanders Peirce returned to foundational issues, the meaning of the real and the true, the real existence of universals as understood in medieval philosophy, the foundations of logic and the relation of individuals to the community in which they live and act, to plot the course of a new philosophical trajectory. Peirce's pragmatism re uh, rejects the quest for certainty as futile. It accepts instead the more humble but valuable job of evaluating probabilities and improving confidence in the imperfect knowledge actually available to us. At the same time, Peirce sets aside dualistic tendencies that have haunted Western philosophy, at least since Plato, and that were baked into much modern thought in the questions posed by Descartes. Instead, he envisions our relation to the world as a semiotic web of signs and interpretation in which we too are signs that generate inferences and interpretations. Peirce's pragmatism grounds observational science without being reductionist. It has a place for human thought in the world without being mystical. His vision is sweeping and original, and should you choose to look into his works, they will repay your time and attention. Thank you.